this looks way better than it did last time. Anyway, um, so as usual, here are the stuff that, here, here are the, here's the stuff. Here are the things that I'm gonna be talking about today. It's gonna to be more of an algebra video and what my goal is is to get to a point where I can connect fields and groups in a particular way. Usually this would take a lot of formalism and setup to do all of this very rigorously. Um, I am trying to approach it more from a point of view of intuition and making it a little bit more accessible to think about. If we're gonna go ahead and connect groups and fields, I should probably start off by talking about fields. If you don't know what a group is though, uh, before I jump in there, uh, if you don't know what a group is, I have done a video way, way, way back in the past about groups and sort of introducing what those are at a very um, fundamental level um, where I go into the definition and sort of like what that means. So if you don't know what a group is, I go check that out first. But at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about fields. A field essentially is something that acts a lot like the real numbers when we think about the real numbers algebraically. So to be a little bit more mathy about that, we can go ahead and give the definition. So a field is defined to be a commutative ring with unity such that all of the non-zero elements are units. That's a lot of jargon. Um, so we're just gonna break this down a little bit. The first thing to notice is that a field is a special type of ring. That's the base object here at play. And a ring is an algebraic thing that works well with two operations, an addition-like operation and a multiplication-like operation. So for the addition on a ring, we're gonna have that addition is commutative, we're gonna have addition is associative, we're gonna have that there is an identity element for addition, so there exists some zero-like thing where if you add zero to anything else, you just get that thing that you added it to. Addition also has inverses for everything. So for every element in your ring, there exists a negative version of that element in some sense, such that when you add the element and it's negative together, you get to the additive identity. So multiplication in a ring doesn't need to be that strict for it to be just a ring. So multiplication needs to be associative, and then there are the distributive laws that need to occur within the ring. So uh, multiplication needs to be left distributive, and then also multiplication needs to be right distributive. And the order here is important in both of the distributive laws, because at no point do we require in just the base object of a ring that multiplication be commutative. But that also pulls in the first qualifier of a field, right? It's a commutative ring. So for a ring to be a commutative ring, then multiplication also has to be commutative. So a commutative ring alone doesn't guarantee a field because if we want things to work like the real numbers, we also have to have an idea of a multiplicative identity. And that's what this with unity thing means. If a ring is with unity, then it has a multiplicative identity. And then the last part of this definition is that every non-zero element is a unit. And this is similar to how all of the non-zero elements in the real numbers have multiplicative inverses. And so that's what it means for everything to be a unit. And in particular, a unit is just some element in the ring such that that element has a multiplicative inverse that gets you back to the multiplicative identity. And so mathematically, this is sort of the formal structure that gets you to more general things beyond just the real numbers algebraically. So some more examples of fields are actually quite common. You've probably worked with them before. Um, you can use the rational numbers. You can also use the real numbers, as we've already mentioned, and you can also use the complex numbers. And so even though the primary focus of this video is to connect groups and fields in some way, I also think it's a good place to bring up some non-examples of fields or just other types of rings that an algebraist might be interested in. Uh, so for example, you could have a commutative ring without unity, which just means that there is no multiplicative identity in the ring, but multiplication commutes, and then it has all the other properties. An example of this is the even integers. So um, the even numbers, one is not an even number, so you can't have the multiplicative identity. But then it's also commutative because multiplication commutes. Another non-example would be a non-commutative ring with unity. Matrix rings are usually really good examples here, so just to pick one, 
um, if we take two by two matrices with entries in the real numbers, we'll get a non-commutative ring because matrix multiplication is not a commutative multiplication. But you then you also have the identity in there because the identity matrix is a matrix with real entries. And then the last one to just axe both of the nice things that come up in fields without thinking about units. We can also think about non-commutative rings that don't have unity. So again, matrix rings are a good candidate for this because they're non-commutative multiplication, but then if we pull in the even integers, we can combine those to take two by two matrices with even integer entries and you have a non-commutative ring that does not have the identity matrix in the ring, so it does not have unity. So yeah, that was a thing, but aside from all that, you're probably wondering like where and why do we care about formalizing the real numbers and what are we gonna do with the structure of fields to get to groups? Um, the easiest way to mo motivate this is to talk about something that you probably learned about in like middle school or did in like algebra at some point uh, with factoring polynomials. Generally speaking, we're used to thinking about polynomials as being functions, but in algebra, you can think about polynomials as a set of objects. And generally how we do this is we take the polynomial ring, which is the mathematical object where all polynomials live for a given field. So how we set up a polynomial ring is that we go ahead and we have a field and we adjoin a variable to that field. So the notation here for the adjoining operator is important because the square brackets mean that we don't get any rational functions. Um, so just to write this in set form, we're only getting linear combinations of the variable with coefficients in the field that we chose. So that looks like a sub n times x to the n plus dot 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 a sub 1 times x plus a sub 0 such that all of the a's are in our field. The reason that we're using a field to make these polynomials is because the algebra on the coefficients is going to play nice and there's going to be a solid notion of what it means to factor a polynomial so you're not going to get any weird things where you have two non-zero elements that multiply together to get zero or something like that, which can happen in other algebraic objects that you could use to form your polynomials, but we're talking about polynomials that come from adjoining a variable to a field. And so to pull things back to factoring, the question that we can ask that's also going to drag us along to getting to groups and that group field connection is given a polynomial in your polynomial ring k adjoined with some variable, can you go ahead and linearly factor that polynomial using coefficients that live in your field k? Or do you need something more to be in your field? And so the answer to this is that sometimes you need more things and sometimes you don't. And so to take an example of a sometimes we can do it with just the elements in our base field, we can go ahead and look at a polynomial in the rational polynomial ring. Let's say p of x is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. That polynomial is a perfect square, and so we can go ahead and factor it as x plus 1 all squared, um, and that is a product of linear factors, x plus 1 times x plus 1, that have rational coefficients. So all of our coefficients stayed in our field of the rationals and we didn't need anything more. And so in the case where we sometimes need more stuff is where we get things that are a little bit more interesting. And this is the example that's going to drag us to getting to a connection to groups. So if we go ahead and take a, another polynomial in the rational polynomial ring, let's call it g of x, such that g of x is equal to x to the fourth minus x cubed minus x minus one. Um, it might take you a while to factor this, but um, it's actually pretty easy if you just add zero. So you can add zero to this polynomial in the form of negative x squared plus x squared and put it right smack dab in the middle. So you get x to the fourth minus x cubed minus x squared plus x squared minus x minus one. And then you can factor out an x squared from the first three terms, and then you can factor out the x squared minus x minus 1 from both of those things, and you end up with x squared plus 1 times x squared minus x 
minus one. So we were able to factor it, but we were only able to get down to quadratic factors, which is a problem. We need to keep going. But we can't keep going just using rational coefficients, since if we were to go ahead and factor x squared plus 1, we were going to need an i to be present in the field of the rational numbers, which i is a complex number, it's not in the field of rational numbers. And then to factor x squared minus x minus 1, this is a famous quadratic that gets you to solutions of the golden ratio, if you just use the quadratic formula that gets you there too. So there x would need to be 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. And the problem there is that the square root of 5 isn't in the field. Um, because if the square root of 5 was in the field, we could go ahead and build up to 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. So we can actually go ahead and diagram out what additions that we would need to make to each field in order to factor these things. So if we start with our base field of the rational numbers, we have the polynomial factoring in the quadratics. And then if we were to add i to it, which we're going to write as the rational numbers parenthetical i, and I'll explain what that notation means in a minute for the purposes of this explanation, it's not really required. Um, if we were to add i to the field, then g of x would then factor into x plus i times x minus i times that other quadratic factor. And then we could go ahead and do a final step where we go ahead and add the square root of 5 to the field. So we can write this as q parenthetical i comma square root of 5. And then there, g of x would factor completely into linear factors of x plus i times x minus i times x minus 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 times x minus 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2. The other thing to note here is that we could actually go ahead and build this up a different way. So we can go ahead and start with the rational numbers and then build up to q with the square root of 5 added to it. And then we could build that up to the final field of the rationals with i and the square root of 5 added to it. And so this diagram is going to be the main vehicle that's going to get us from fields to groups, but it's going to take a little bit more work. So I'm going to clear the board here and then we're just going to flesh out what exactly this q parenthetical element thing means. Um, and then I'm going to talk about just how to think about this and how we end up at a group of things, um, which is it's, it's kind of cool. I think it's pretty cool. It does a lot for us and it will open up some other topics that I can talk about by referencing this video. So that's also exciting. Anyway, redrawing out that diagram, we had the rationals and then the rationals with i added to it and then the rationals with the square root of 5 added to it and then the rationals with i and the square root of 5 added to it. So just to flesh out what those things actually mean as sets, the rationals is just the rational numbers. And so this q with i added in is q extended by i is another way of reading that. Um, and that is equal to the set of a plus b i such that a and b are rational numbers. And the extended by i thing is very suggestive that this is still a field. It's just got a little bit more stuff to play with in it. And that is true. q extended by i is a field. But I would recommend that you take a moment to go ahead and prove it to yourself or to convince yourself of that fact. So then similarly, q extended by the square root of 5 is equal to the set a plus b times the square root of 5, such that a and b are rational numbers. And lastly, the rationals extended by i and the square root of 5 looks like this mess. And so this first version of it would be analogous to extended by i first and then extending by the square root of 5. The second version of this would be extending by the square root of 5 first and then extending by i. And then the third version is another way of writing the first one. And then the fourth one is another way of writing the second one. So that was a lot ish. Uh, at least the explanation of the last set was sort of like, yeah. With that being said, the important thing here is that these extensions by an element are still fields and these extended fields are just enough of what we need to go ahead and factor the polynomial completely into linear factors. So we can actually go ahead and relate the field diagram to a diagram of polynomial factorizations. So we can go ahead and relate the rationals to the quadratic factorization we had. We can go ahead and 
relate the field q extended by i to the factorization with x plus i and x minus i linear factors. A similar thing can be said about the rationals extended by the square root of 5. And then lastly, um, we get our linear factors from the rationals extended by i and by the square root of 5. So this might come out of left field, or you just may be asking yourself this question. But the question we're going to ask is, well, could we have gone a different route with how we extended the fields? And what this is going to get at is how free were we when we were going about extending the field? Is there a different way to it, add things in that wouldn't change stuff? And so we can go ahead and get an idea of how much freedom we had here by looking at the polynomials and how they factored with respect to each field extension. In particular, we're focused on if a certain transformation to what we extended by will change the order of the factors in our factorizations. So, for example, if we go ahead and look at x plus i times x minus i times x squared minus x minus 1, the factorization that we got from extending by i, what we can do is we can look and see that if we go ahead and manipulate i, if we go ahead and send i to negative i, which is an alternative way of extending by i, we'll actually permute the x plus i and x minus i factors because the mapping will change plus i to minus i and minus i to plus i. However, if we go ahead and map the square root of 5 to the negative square root of 5, that works because it fixes the entire polynomial. And, and in particular, it doesn't mess with the x squared minus x minus 1 because it's not completely factored. The other thing we could do here is just leave everything alone. And that would give us an identity transformation as well. And so the resultant set are two transformations. One is the identity transformation, and the other one is the square root of 5 going to negative square root of 5. By similar analysis on the factorizations for each extension field, we can get a similar set of transformations. And so how this plays out is that for the case where we extended by the square root of 5, we can actually manipulate i and send that to negative i instead of doing what we did with the square root of 5, and we also get the identity. If we look at the fully factored polynomial, the only thing that we can do that doesn't permute the factors is just do the identity transformation. And then with the rationals where we could only factor into two quadratic terms, we can actually do more. We can do the identity, we can mess with i, we can mess with the square root of 5, or we can mess with both i and the square root of 5 at the same time. So the important thing about these four sets of transformations is that they're actually groups. And in particular, they're groups of automorphisms. This sort of messy diagram over here is a drawn out version of something we can refer to as the Galois correspondence. But yeah, this is an example of how you can connect fields and their extensions to groups. And so the cool thing about this connection is that it, it works in more generality than I've just presented here with one example. And it allows us to take certain problems about fields and turn them into problems about groups. A lot of the time, at least with some really cool problems, working with the groups and the group properties are a lot easier than trying to work directly with the fields. And it leads to some really cool things that I will be able to talk about at a later point because this video has been long and we should probably cut it off. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, trying to focus more on algebra things because it pairs well with the studying that I need to be doing for um, the algebra qualifying exam. If I decide to take the algebra qualifying exam my first term of my PhD program. So unclear if I'm going to do that yet or not, but I've just sort of started dabbling back into what algebra is um, in the abstract. Uh, so that's the thing that's going on. Um, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video again. Maybe give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics content. Uh, but yeah, I'm Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.